Paul Asadorian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Paul.com Security Weekly, episode 274, for Thursday, January 19th, 2012. Wow, that music's really loud. We could just turn it down just to, just, oh, thanks, Dave. Wow, it's really, really distracting. Welcome, everyone. We've got a, a fantastic show for you, as usual, for all of our security friends across the world. Joining me here in the studios is, of course, none other than Mr. Larry Pesce. Yeah. What's going on, dude? Same shit, different day. And, of course, Mr. Darren Wrigley is here in the studios. Back, back from the trash of Southern Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, There's a lot of trash in Southern Jersey. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's good check, stuff, too. Check out the Twitter feed. Yeah. It's pictures of me in a dumpster. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Dave, the AV guy is here in the studio. Making it happen on the video and the audio. Thank you very much, Dave. Of course, uh, I believe from South Dakota at an undisclosed location somewhere. Mr. John Strand, John, are you there? Yes, I am. Excellent. John is literally dropping the kids off at the pool. Yep. Okay. Well, also, we- I'm in search. Screw high def video. I'm looking for high def voice today. <laughs> <laughs> And from sunny Puerto Rico, welcome, Mr. Carlos Perez. Hey, guys. How's it going, Carlos? Here. Yeah, it's good to have everyone here for this edition. And just a few quick announcements. Sign up for Paul.com training at the Mid-Atlantic CCDC, March 13th through the 14th. John Strand will give offensive countermeasures, defensive techniques that actually work. And Carlos Perez <laughs> will give us using and automating the Metasploit framework. You can visit paul.com.com forward slash training for all the latest training security courses offered by Paul.com. Of course, check out our new shows, Hack Naked TV with John Strand, Hack Naked at Night with none other than Larry and Darren, Paul.com Espanol with Carlos Perez, and our only non-computer security related show dedicated to the cigar enthusiast Stogie Geeks with myself and Tim Margarini. Uh, you can sc- subscribe to all of our shows by visiting the Paul.com homepage and using the subscription links in the upper right-hand corner. In other notes about training, John Strand will be teaching offensive countermeasures at Sands Orlando March 23rd through the 24th. Registration link is in the show notes. All you got to do is click it. As well as Larry's teaching of Security 617 Wireless, Ethical Hacking, Penetration Testing, and Defense. Five times this year, the links are in the show notes. All you have to do is click them and you can register. Yes, working on a discount code. Yes, and uh, discount code coming soon. So, now that we've gotten through all of the announcements, Jack Daniel is on vacation. Dare he? He will take a, uh, a short little break and come back with our first guest. As soon as I figure out how to use my own soundboard. <laughs> One wouldn't think after so many episodes. You know what? It's a long story. Time. I had the soundboard, and then there's this spaces thing in Lion, and it it ate my soundboard. That's my that's my excuse. Like my dog ate my homework. Spaces ate my soundboard. We still wasn't screaming. Then we're that. always trying to figure out: do we drink, then set up the soundboard, or set up the soundboard, yeah. then drink? And at least it wasn't screen that ate it. That's true. It's true. Andrew back with a man who, of course, needs no introduction, but we'll do one anyway. Mr. H.D. Moore, the chief security officer at Rapid7 and founder of the Metasploit Project, uh, who founded the Metasploit Project in the summer of 2003 with the goal of becoming a public resource for exploit code research and development. He's also known for his work on Warvox, Axeman, the Metasploit Uncloaking Project, and Rogue Network Link Detection Tools. Welcome, H.D., to the show. Oh, thanks, Paul. Uh, so, HD, um, I wanted you to come on and tell us a little about some of the recent changes to the Metasploit framework, uh, specifically some of the uh, functionality and features that have been adding and removing uh, as of late. Yeah, no problem. Um, a couple, uh, I think probably two shows ago, one show ago, you guys dove into some of the changes uh, regarding like RPC, um, DB Autophone, things like that that were pulled out of the framework. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to give some color to kind of the background of that and kind of the direction we're going. Um, you know, we love open source, we love the framework, we're putting tons of, you know, just people, time, money, et cetera, into it, because it really drives everything we do as, you know, from a personal level, because we have no lives, but also the products we build at my company. Um, 
if you start looking at the changes we made and kind of the direction we're going, we try to qualify things as being very specific to what the framework should do. And, you know, you look at some of the stuff that Carlos Perez is doing with his awesome automation work, his plugins, the things he's doing there. Uh, you look at the stuff that's happening outside of kind of the core Metasploit project for resource scripts, uh, and it just didn't belong in the framework itself. If you look at DB Autopone, it was just this ugly, warded little mutant that's been sitting there for three years, gathering dust and pissing off script kitties left and right. <laughs> and this is something that we felt that anybody with, you know, two brain cells rubbed together could reinvent better as a resource script. So we really focused on taking the automation capabilities in Metasploit and enhancing those, but taking the automation itself out and putting those into third-party repositories. Gotcha. <clears throat> so was the DB Autopone, was that a uh, user... Um, generated a uh, user uh, uh, developed script or was that from someone in who was actually working on the framework um, uh, more of uh, a full time or well DB Autopon was something I created so you know if you, if you ever had an angry father yell at you I made you I'll, I'll take you away um, that's kind of how I felt about DB Autopon <laughs> nice. it was a boarded yeah. little baby monstrosity that just didn't fucking belong it was the wrong thing for the wrong job right, it did a right. terrible job of what it's supposed to do and it just got abused in ways that you know, if it was really good at what it did, we would have left it there. But it's a case that we would have so many complaints about it not working properly. Yeah. Only to be followed by complaints of it not being there. So it's one of those cases where we either <laughs> have to buckle down and do it right or get the hell out of the kitchen. And we decided that it really belonged outside the project. If someone else wants to make it awesome, that's great. Well, and I, I think, you know, when you look at any software project, they all kind of, you come to crossroads with features and you start to say, well, is it worth it to maintain this feature? Um, and like you said, you were fielding all these questions where your time and other developers' time could be spent on better things rather than trying to maintain something that's just going in the wrong direction. That's really it. Do you want a script kit to have DB Autophone or do you want to have more exploits? And that's kind of the decision we had to make at the end of the day. Right, right. Um, also, you have to, talk, ahead, to take into consideration DB Autophone. Uh, that, that, that has been kind of the subject in the channel for quite a bit. Also on Twitter... DB Autopone was only going through ports. If this port is open, let's launch all of the exploits that we know that work for this port. Let's launch them against them. Well, if you're a pen tester, uh, you know that if you try to, and you have some brain cell, as, as HD mentioned, and you have done this before, you know that you're going to bring a box down if you start pushing crap against one, one port on a, on a system time and time again, just trying to run an ISS exploit against an Apache server or Apache exploits against uh, an IIS server. Yeah, I mean, personally, I never, I never used DB Autopone, maybe for uh, exa examples or as a demonstration uh, for people to say, you know, if you were to let this run, here's what it would do kind of thing. Um, but never, never on a pen test like that, so... We actually joked about having the plugin have the same output but not actually doing anything and <laughs> seeing if anyone actually noticed. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a mean <laughs> trick to play in all the script kitties. <laughs> no, it to be honest, we don't think it would have been a difference at all because the code is so broken. All it's doing yeah. is sodding Windows boxes left and right. It's like, you know what? If this was a usable tool, maybe the people who write the code would use it. <laughs> right, right. So um, so if someone wants more automation uh, while we're on the subject, what, what, are their, what are their options now? Oh, it's ridiculous. You have, um, I mean, Carlos can probably dive into a huge list of things you have available, but um, for anyone who's familiar with resource scripts, so you've got, you can basically automate Metasploit at the API level, which is outside the process, do an RPC script from any language. You can automate it from the plugin side to add new console commands. You can automate it from a resource script, which drives the console driver itself. Mm -hmm. You can create auxiliary models that automate every single thing inside the, inside the back end automatically, and then run those auxiliary models from any UI, whether it's mine, Armitage, Pro, framework, whatever, it doesn't matter to us. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so many different levels you can integrate and automate at this point. It's just ridiculous for us to create yet another place that things can go wrong. Right. Um, the resource scripts alone went through a huge upgrade recently that no one really uh, noticed, I think. Um, previously, resource scripts were basically a, just a giant list of commands that got fed into the console. Mm -hmm. And then we added the ability to embed Ruby blocks to it. More recently, though, we actually made them ERB templates. So if, you, if you've written a Rails app before and you do like, you know, you know PHP style tags, like, you know, lesson sign, uh, percent sign, and then you have some Ruby code, those now actually automatically expand the resource scripts. So you can have a resource script that expands out to an even bigger resource script based on what code's available within the database. So you can actually put in intelligent Ruby code inside of your, your resource scripts. And that's all the point. I mean, we're also doing making changes to API itself at this point. And, you know, Brandon Perry, some other folks have done a great job of making these examples. If you're inside the Metasploit console, you just type IRB. All it takes is one line to run one exploit against a particular host mm -hmm. or every exploit against a particular host. I mean, it's, it's really literally one line of Ruby. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get folks to kind of think a little bit about what they're trying to do and really make some decisions about how they want to direct their automation as opposed to using some built-in kind of, you know, dot slash everything script. Right, right. 
Yeah, so it's not like you removed the automation. There are more and better ways to do it, is what you're saying. It's anytime you have something that folks say, okay, if I click this, it's going to do it for me. There's an expectation that it's actually going to work properly. Mm -hmm. And for us, the support headache of like, you know, you really have to think about it a little bit more. You have to, you know, you're going to make different decisions depending on your environment. Um, it's, it's something that we felt that this was a cha direction change that if someone wants to maintain autophone outside the framework like they have done, that's great. We love that. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as like automation, there's so many better ways to do it and what people actually think about them as opposed to say, well, that's just autophone doesn't do anything. Like, so Autophone, if you don't remember, was the butt of every joke related to Metasploit for three and a half years. And we, we made the joke. We thought it was hilarious. Mm -hmm. Like, we thought it was the stupidest thing ever, but it was the shotgun mode just to basically say, hey, run everything. It blew our minds that after removing it, we heard so many cries of despair. Right, right, right. Um, so, no, you mentioned the API inside of uh, Metasploit. How has that evolved over the years? Well, we've had a few APIs. Originally, we had just basically the module API, which has been fairly, um, not static, but you know, it hasn't changed too much since 2005 when we first did the port from Perl. Um, since then, we've added a, a database API, which wraps all the underlying database objects. Um, you know, if anyone who was around during that kind of transition time remembers, moving to basically a database being the default option versus an optional option was another huge you know, good point of contention. We went through this whole process again there saying, you know, I don't want a database. Yes, I do. It's too big. It's too small. How about SQLite? So there's all these, you know, every time we make a big change, like this, there's a lot of pain to get through it. But once we're there, it's much better. Um, mm -hmm. So we've got the database API now, which makes it very easy to say, find every object matching this, like find every machine with this port open, automatically run these five modules against it, take the results, do things with them. That's all great. That works fine. Since then, we've added a secondary API above that, which now lets you drive the entire framework from an outside process through the message pack RPC interface. So what is, what is the, uh, the interface again? Uh, we looked at a lot of options for um, XML RPC. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the default before. And what we found is the XML RPC uh, drivers would either require a whole lot of external gems to work properly um, and still not be able to handle every case we want, or we'd have to find a different binary-based RPC mechanism. So we ended up looking at something called Message Pack. It's, it's kind of the same reason why you picked Ruby in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's like, do you pick the tool that's easiest to integrate with, or do you pick the right tool for the job? Mm -hmm. and in this case, Message Pack was a way to not only be able to automate all the RPC interfaces and Metasploit, like run a module, get an exploit, and work the shell, but it can do large-scale binary transfers over the same protocol with a very low overhead of memory. So if you want to upload a 100 meg XML file through it, let's say the, the scan results of an Expo's vulnerability scan, you can send that directly through the encrypted message pack channel with very little memory overhead, load the data directly, and now start scanning those hosts. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't do that with those other protocols we looked at without doing things like base 4 or mining coding, things like that. Yuck. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, so now, um, is there, uh, if someone wants to interface with the Metasploit API, are there some guides to kind of help people uh, get used to the, the new API calls? We've been on the fence about it. We wrote a lot of integration guides for the, the commercial products, uh, Metasploit Pro, uh, you know, Soulblade Rabbit 7, etc. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of functionality that's actually on the Pro side that we document. And there's definitely some free, you know, free API calls. We're trying to figure out the best way to deliver that today because we've got, um, on the commercial side, we have actual contractual obligations to keep some of the API working for certain customers. Mm -hmm. But on the open source side, we do change things quite a lot. So we're trying to figure out where we're going to stay on that going forward. Right. Uh, we'll probably end up creating kind of secondary external SDK that folks can use to integrate with the product. Uh, and that way, it's, it makes things you know cleaner. We can have versioned SDK versions as opposed to versioned SVN snapshots. And so we're sorting it out still. You should probably hear about it in the next two weeks. OK, excellent. Very cool. Um, so uh, speaking of the commercial version, so what are the, um, when people make the progression from the open source to the commercial versions, what are the differences between them? The way I like to describe it, and I'm sure our marketing folks would put a bullet in my head if they heard this, but <laughs> it's basically the sweat meter. It's, it's on the far left side, you got zero dollars and it's all your sweat. On the far right side, it's all of our sweat and a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a product that does everything that it should do with one click, then it's going to cost something. If you want to build out incremental support, Build your own automation. It's free, open source BSD, um, and there's different points in between. A Metasploit Community Edition was a great first step because it takes the UI that we put all the work into mm -hmm. on the Pro and Express side and makes most of that available for free. Uh, but you know, freeze if you're not freezing code kind of license. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest difference you'll see is the the logic, the automation, and the chaining. Like I did a, a I was on a web a webcast earlier today where we talked about password auditing. Um, if you want to use Metasploit for password auditing, we have all the individual tools available in the framework, and that's not going to change. We'll continue piling more code, you know, more developers at it. You know, the, the faster the commercial product grows, the more developers we assign to the framework. And we have a very fixed ratio that we use to, to basically put our investment back into the open source code base. So that's not going away anytime soon. Um, but if you look at what Pro does about it, Pro, you know, in the framework you can say, I want to take the SH login module, pass it this set of keys, tell it to test this range of hosts. That's great. In the pro side, you can say, scan this network, find information with this commercial open, regardless of what port it's on, 
automatically attach to every default login. Once you get into a system, automatically pillage all the keys you find in that system. Take those keys, now use that to rate every other system in the network, get into those systems, keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that. And so we see the pro side as being kind of your Skynet version, whereas mm -hmm. the Metasploit side is you're driving every step. Right, right, gotcha. right. Well, unless, so the, unless, of course, you develop your own automation to do the Skynet version, but that's oh, your absolutely. sweat. Oh, absolutely. That's, your, that's, that's your sweat. They can, they yeah. can fight. Yeah. <laughs> So the, the functionality in the framework is there. It's how you're automating it that um, is creeping into the commercial version. Yeah, and it's automation, it's logic. It's also like some data stuff. Like if we have to go spend, you know, three weekends straight digging up every fingerprint for a particular type of device to create really precise fingerprinting for an exploit, we may add some of those targets and stuff to the, the, the pro side as well as the commercial side. What you won't see is any major difference in functionality with very few exceptions between the pro and commercial. So if we have a new exploit, the exploit's going to go into the, the framework first, and then a week after it goes to the QA, it'll end up in pro. Mm -hmm. um, something like you know, VPN pivoting is one of the few features we have right now that if you want to do layer two Ethernet pivoting, it's only in pro. And the reason for that is there's actually commercial licensing clauses and some other crap you can't get into on the framework side for open source, where it doesn't actually make sense to do it because we'd have to pay an arm and a leg to be able to uh, support it on the, frame, on the free side. Mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. Um, so let's see, what's your favorite new feature that's been added to Metasploit in the past six months? Um, I've got the memory of a snail, so <laughs> like for me it's whatever I wrote last, which right. is a lot of fun. Not just what I wrote, but what the rest of the team wrote. And the thing I've been focused on the last few days has been this neat little trick with the secure shell protocol. If you authenticate to a machine using a public key authentication secure shell, oh. there's your private key and your public key. You give the system, you give you know, whoever you're logging into your public key, they add it to your authorized keys, then you use a private key to authenticate. That's how we all think of it. It's actually more complicated. There's actually two steps involved. The first step is actually you connect to the server and say, here's my public key, can I authenticate? The server comes back and says, yes, you can. Then you sign it with your private key as the challenge. And that protocol level spec is implemented everywhere across Cisco, across Netgear, across every device screening SH2, basically. Now, what's awesome about that is if you have someone's public key, you can now scan every machine on the network and figure out which ones they can log into yeah. by only doing the first part of the authentication process and then dumping it off after you're done. So what we found is this really neat application to that. If you fire an employee and that employee, you only have his public key, he never gave you his private key or private mm -hmm. passphrase, you can take the authorized keys file mm -hmm. from one server and then scan every other system on the network to figure out what machine he still has access to and lock him out. Wow. So for just doing basic employee termination, it's a really great use case. What's even more fun is if you have, um, sorry for ranting, um, if you no, have a, uh, let's say there's someone who's been trolling you or attacking your sites, and you have a copy of the public key from a previous site that they had access to, they get a copy of it, or they publish on their website like a lot of folks do, you can use their public key to scan the machines that are attacking you and see whether his key is on the authorized keys list for that server, and then de-anonymize the system in the process. Hmm. Huh. So anyways, it's a fun little trick. It's like totally worthless, but it's a lot of fun, and we're finding some neat business use cases for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that that whole user termination deal. That yeah, is, that's, that's the, very applicable. Yeah, because I you know I, we go into places all the time and see that type of stuff where hey you know the you know, Active Directory infrastructure is great, but all of their Unix Linux systems and, and so forth are not in some directory structure where they have centralized management, and that's a challenge for them. That's cool. No, now I know why every time I'm doing SVN up. I'm seeing a bunch of SSH stuff going down yeah. the wire. <laughs> so, HD, I got another question kind of on that vein. Are there any modules that you've created or seen committed to Metasploit that you think are just wicked awesome, but you very rarely see penetration testers use it? Yeah, that was my next question, too, because I, you know... <laughs> man, when you manage... There's someone's in there that there probably is only one customer on the face of the plan vulnerable to it, but it was totally worth adding for a reason. <laughs> Which one's that? There's a, so, you know, there's a couple examples there that are models that affect such a small percent of the internet install base that there's almost no reason for that module to even exist in this framework at all, except for the fact that making it public convinces a vendor to get authorized and do something about it. Yes. So we have a few models right now that you know, a lot of, you know, anonymous submitters will contribute, for example, for a product no one's heard of, no one cares about, only affects probably 15 systems in the whole world, but the fact that it's part of Metasploit made a vendor get off their, get off their ass to fix the bug. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, if, if, the, if that's what it today, we're very clear of that. If that's what it comes down to, and you know that was the uh, one of the only options, and I can see that happening, especially with smaller vendors, um, that's certainly a good thing and contributes to the greater good. So, I mean, the one the skate the skate stuff that came out today for GE was a really good example of that. It's like a freaking it's a you know it's it's basically a backdoor built into TFTP file writes and file reads that was just amazing. It's like who the hell thought this would be a good idea to implement from a 
security point of view or network protocol point of view, and there's probably not that many operators using this particular equipment, but the folks involved on Digital Bond and the you know the Basecamp project decided that the only way we can really get the vendor's attention is to release Metasploit modules for that, and they did. So now there's a public BSE license code you can use to implement anything you want to around this protocol. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So, H.E., is there, is there functionality, um, you know, like aside from uh, exploits that you think has been built into the Metasploit framework that people just aren't aware of or just aren't using? <laughs> Holy crap, man, yeah. Like, <laughs> so if you look at um, the recent Warbox work I did, I basically ported an entire IAX2 uh, Asterix uh, VoIP stack, including audio codecs, into Metasploit as a protocol library. Mm-hmm. So you can make, like, audio phone calls with Metasploit and do, like, you know, signal analysis. And that's something just added for fun as part of the Warbox stuff. A more recent example is there's a whole H323 stack, which you'll probably hear about a whole lot more soon, uh, around video conferencing equipment because of another research project that hasn't quite come to light yet, but you'll hear about it soon as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of little things like that. If you ever go through, like, you know, uh, your MSF install uh, Live Rex Proto, there's a ton of stuff buried in there that there really is no other public reference for. We've got protocol stacks for vendor-specific protocols that no one's ever really documented the level we have so far. But if you ever run into a machine running MDMP or running you know, one of these wacky protocols, we have everything you need to build the best exploit known to man already. Oh, that's and it, so can those libraries also be used for fuzzing too? Absolutely, we actually do. If you look at, um, there's actually a whole fuzzing framework built in the Metasploit we rarely talk about, but it's actually, it's mostly a bunch of proof, exam- proof of concepts versus real examples. But we have, um, under auxiliary uh, models, auxiliary fuzzers, you'll see a bunch of models there. And what those do is they use a bunch of mix-ins that do things like byte sweeping. So mm-hmm. they'll take every byte of existing protocol or existing request and modify it to be every possible byte value and sweep through it. Um, other ones are like bit corruption. Other ones are replacing every string with a certain length string and incrementing the string lengths. We've got a bad number library to generate various uh, mul- multiples of you know, powers of two, plus and minus various offsets, trick or bugs. So there's a whole pile of code there that no one really looks at these days. But it's you know invaluable to building your own tools. Mm-hmm. You know, in addition to that, you also make the Rex library available as a gem, also, right? Yes, but always if you install it, do dash dash no doc dash dash no ri, or it'll take about three and a half gigs of RAM and about three li- three hours to build the documentation for it. But it's like seventy five thousand classes of Ruby. So. Wow! Wow! Ooh. Yeah, because you're still now Metasploit is still the largest Ruby project, right? Aside from Rails. We were, we're about 1.5x a few years ago. We're probably around 2 or 3x now as far as code base. Mm-hmm. But I mean, keep in mind, we also take in all of Active Record, a big chunk of Rails. Like Those projects are small enough that we can actually embed them as a dependency as opposed to being a large portion of our code. Yeah, um, yeah. The single large portion of our code base is definitely the modules followed by the Rex library. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, so uh, back to the, the protocol fuzzer, I find that to be very useful. You know, Looking into some of the embedded systems I've looked into, um, specifically in entertainment devices, they're implementing these protocols that you know deep down are just horrible, and you have a tough time finding tools being able to interface with them. So it sounds like Metasploit may already have that, and if you were to build that, I'm assuming that it's pretty easy using the Rex library, so if you wanted to build a fuzzer in a different protocol, would you, uh, obviously you would recommend Metasploit, but is that, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, how difficult is that? Uh, not always. Depends on how, how detailed you want to get. If you have an example um, communication stream, like you, you do a TCP dump or you've got an example packet you've already seen, like look at some of the models already in auxiliary, fuzzle, auxiliary fuzzers because you can take an existing module, modify three or four lines, paste your blob into yeah, it, and then yeah. have that basically do a byte sweep across the our protocol, nice. basically for free. Nice. But if, you, if you're hardcore about fuzzing, there's much better tools out there. I mean, yeah. Fuzz obviously is a way better tool, mm-hmm. has a lot more kind of back-end fuzzing, block-based support. There's still Spike, of course. So we're not the end all be all of fuzzing, but it's definitely a quick way to get started. Yep, awesome, awesome. Um, let's see. So, what are some of the uh, future directions for the Metasploit project? Like, where are you taking things in the future? You know, I know um, exploit development has been important, but you know, maybe how is that uh, evolving as time goes on? Uh, well, I mean, we're seeing a, a big move away from exploits in the standard pop some shell, you know, get some shell code running kind of thing, and we're really focusing more on everything else that's out there. Like, if you look at the focus of exploits over the last um, year or so, we averaged about a module a day across all of 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of those were actually auxiliary models. They're stuff that weren't directly exploits. They're payloads that were for, you know, command injection vulnerabilities. Um, we're really looking at everything else in security and even IT in some cases. Um, if you look at the secure shell work, a lot of it was really based around a need to, you know, see whether I locked an employee out properly when we had to let them go. Um, so we're really looking at becoming more of a general purpose uh, networking toolkit for folks to build things on, on the framework side. Um, on the pro side, we've got a few directions we're going, but we can't talk about those quite yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, essentially, it's whatever our customers tell us. We'll, we want to build it and find the best way to solve their needs. Um, 
in the short term, what you'll see in the next month or two is a conversion on the back end of the framework from our existing Rails 2 interface and Active Record 2 to Active Record 3. Um, probably an overhaul of the entire database system again, just to make things a little bit faster and more productive. And definitely a real hard look at scalability and uh, being able to handle you know, more than 1,100 shells at a time, for instance. Right, right, right. Nice, nice. Um, so how do uh, people contribute code to the Metasploit project? Like, what are the different ways you could contribute code? Tons, man. I mean, we've got, uh, so this community website, we, we're always looking for folks to kind of talk about use cases and, you know, post examples. Uh, GitHub has been a really good use case so far. We've had folks kind of fork the project, come up with really neat, cool features, submit them back in. Um, some of them take a while, long time for us to go through and kind of sign off on just because there's so many other moving parts. We don't want to break a release. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was but, a change. You know, and that was, a change that was a change recently, right? So you guys are vetting all user submitted changes into the framework, right? Well, it's, it's backwards, actually. So before what happened is there was kind of this, like, trusted insider group that could do direct commits to the framework. Mm -hmm. And that was fine. Like, we love those folks. Like, you know, there's a lot, Carlos is on the call. He was a great contributor. We love Carlos more than anything else. Um, but when we started looking at kind of how we manage code, contributes, code commits going in, we decided we don't even trust ourselves. Like, we actually have uh, code review processes between developers now inside the Metasploit team to make sure we don't break the trunk. Because we're over 150,000 people updating directly from the SVN trunk every day. And for that reason, we have to be very careful what goes in and what doesn't. So the great thing about moving to Git is to put everyone on equal footing. Whether you're an insider, whether you're an outsider, whether you're a developer, everyone has to go through the same review process. Some of it isn't done through GitHub, some it's done outside through another process we have. Uh, but essentially it's a way to do code review before it gets shipped out to 150k people who didn't expect that typo in that line. And we don't always succeed at avoiding those types of problems, but we've done a lot better in quality since that changes occurred. Mm. Very nice. So will Metasploit continue to be the, uh, the moving target to try and uh, document in... Uh and build how to's around. I know that uh, Carlos, John, myself, Larry, all of us really have, uh, you know, we try, we try and get good with yeah, specific sorry, features. <laughs> no, and, we, uh, I mean, we've got this massive, like, we've got this view of kind of where Metasplit needs to be. Mm -hmm. Like, we need to be able to handle, you know, kind of an async event driven system in the back end. We don't want to be able to scale incredibly high on the database side. We want to be able to pivot through anything. We want to be able to handle any type of communication channel. Um, we want to have payloads that are like instantaneous that can do remote scripting. We've got all this stuff kind of in the works right now. It's a question of what piece do we have to put down first to get to the next piece. And for someone who's just looking at SVN kits coming in right now or Git commits these days, it's not always clear that what we're doing has like a larger purpose, but we need to do a better job of actually documenting our roadmap and our direction. Um, I mean, you'll see it come out over the next 6 to 12 months. It's going to take a while to get there. Now, did you, when you first created uh, Metasploit and it was written in Perl, did you ever imagine that it would grow to a, a project of this magnitude? You know, I had my, I had people basically laugh at me for the first three years I worked on it. Like, what's your Perl piece of crap script kitty project, blah, 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 sure. it's all crap, you're helping out script kitties. We basically went from folks, from technical folks saying that code is crap and will never do anything useful, which we agreed to, we rewrote it like nine times. Mm -hmm. um, to the business world saying, you're only helping out the bad guys, that's terrible, stop doing that. Um, to basically companies saying, oh my god, this is liability, how are you doing this stuff, this is terrible. And then the technical folks back you up saying, no, no, we actually use this. And finally the stage now where we're actually playing second fiddle to the black hats. Like, stuff happens in the black hat community way before it happens in the Metasploit. We try to catch up at this point. Mm -hmm. You'll see a new zero day come out for IE, for Flash, for whatever. You know, we jump on it as soon as we see it, but it could take us two days, three days a week to actually get something in. So it's gone from uh, everyone blaming Metasploit for being the driver for Black Ads to now Black Ad uh, exploits now being one of the biggest drivers for Metasploit updates. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of fun to see them go full, full circle now. So what are, your, what are your thoughts on some of the other organizations like Exploit Hub that are, are using the framework to uh, develop exploits and creating a, a business around it? Like, is that, is that, like, totally cool with you? I would imagine it would be if there's... Oh, absolutely. Like, like yeah. we've got BSD code base. The only thing that actually gets under our skin, and for me, I'll, I'll speak personally, the only thing that pisses me off is we have companies who both take the Metasploit code, ship it with their products, mm -hmm. get, you know, tell their customers, hey, we've got Metasploit, we've covered Metasploit modules, and then at the exact same time, talk about how bad the code is and how unreliable it is, and the big mm -hmm. warnings of where saying the code's terrible, the company's dying, the product is terrible. It's like, no, no, pick a side. Right, Support right. the project, get involved, write some code, or shut the fuck up and stop using it. Mm -hmm. So, like, Exploit Hub is totally cool with you. I know that came out of my radar yeah, this, recently. Absolutely. Those guys of... get involved a lot. Um, I actually I used to work with the guy who runs it, and we're, you know, most of the folks who contribute to Exploit Hub are actually already known as white contributors in some form. Right. So there's no, no beef there. And, and for the most part, if you're using it for a private project, we're not going to care. We love that stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're using it for a commercial product, and you talk about the framework and say, it's, hey, we use this code, it's great, we love that too. It's only cases when you're getting the benefit of it while also talking smack about it, that it really gets under my skin. Uh, there's a, hey, HD, who is that company? I think they're out of Europe, maybe France, that 
released a product that pretty much was Metasploit with just a different interface on it. I remember they released it on the framework mailing list and you flamed them pretty hard for oh, it. Oh, from Argentina was uh, Insect? Mm. Was that it? I'm biting my tongue right now. I'm not going to say anything. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> there I was, was many just going to say. And there's many companies in Argentina that sell our product and there's many companies in Argentina that sell our product and no credit is. So you can pick one of <laughs> a few. Yep, mm. Matt. <laughs> All right. I, I know exactly well, where HD is going with this. Yeah, right. there's another just, one that starts with an E. But now, HD, at, at some point you made the decision to be BSD licensed, so you had to kind of foresee that, you know, some of that stuff was going to happen, right? No, absolutely. We love people using the code. Uh, mm -hmm. It's only a case if you're giving something away and people are using it commercially, that's awesome. If they give it away commercially and they say terrible things about it while they're using it in their own products, that's mm -hmm. just that's just rude. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. Yep. <clears throat> um, so, let's see. Let's talk about Warvox. Um, yeah. Larry, you have yeah, some questions yeah. about so, Warvox. So, HD, what you know, you know, I've been a huge fan of Warvox, you know, since about you know when it when it first came out, and you started talking about it. I'm like, wow, this is this is good. I really like this. You know, what's sort of the status of Warvox now? It sort of seems like it's been the the redheaded stepchild, and it's your personal project that doesn't get a lot of attention. I get to work on it like probably four days a year right now, so it's, yeah. it's very spurty. But I mean, the nice thing is those four days, they managed to knock out a whole VoIP stack from scratch and knocked out a new uh, FFT signature system. So it's the point now, I need to find a way to kind of marry that to what I do every day at work. And if I can find a way to kind of officially roll the rest of Warbox into Metasploit, I'll be a happy camper because I can actually justify time on it. Right now, we've actually done, you know, to open the kimono, if you will, we've talked to a lot of companies about is Warbox really something you want to do? If it is, you know, Here's free software. You can use it all you want. Like, we'll help you set up a trial. I'll pay your your phone bill out of my pocket for the first month just to get your feedback on what you actually see valuable about it. And what we found so far is there hasn't been a single company so far that's willing to step up and say, you know what, I actually do want to do voice testing. Huh. So, I mean, technically it's awesome. We think it's a great feedback. We're getting, you know, great responses. We have folks using the field for consulting and assessments now. But we actually try to go to somebody who's, you know, Fortune 500 or Fortune even 2000 um, and say, we want to dial your numbers. Do what? They kind of give you a crazy eye and say, okay, this is 1988. Get back to the, you know, get back to the bunker. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> anyway, so, so we haven't had much success getting companies excited about that type of technology, even though we do feel it is a large risk. No one's really addressing. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things that yeah. bothers me. I mean, if you look at what's happening right now in the news uh, with uh, Rupert Murdoch's uh, media companies and Clearly, it's been happening. You think that people would be much more amicable to actually doing that type of testing, but uh, yeah, I've been seeing the same thing with my customers. They are like, "Yeah, that was cool in 1999." I'm like, "No, this is valid today," um, and they're not really connecting a tool like Warvox with what's happening in the news. Yeah, that's what blew my mind. We had this whole news of the world scandal in Europe, and the whole voicemail hacking thing people talk about. 99 percent of that was just basically calling with the same caller ID as your phone number and bypassing the voicemail. And you can auto-scrape all the voicemails out with something like Warbox fairly easily. So it's something that, even though this stuff is topical, no one really ties that to computers or security or, you know, God help me, cybersecurity. Wow. Drink. You heard it here first. H.G. Moore said cybersecurity on Paul.com. Oh, That's is, two drinks if yeah. you're drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm drinking, I'm drinking. That's an ode to William Gibson right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, so H.G., you think that, that there may be some opportunity to, to integrate Warbox with Metasploit at some point? You're still looking for a way, correct? Well, actually, it's ninety-nine percent done already. Like, what a lot of folks don't realize, we took the entire VoIP stack that was inside Warbox mm -hmm. and moved it into the Rex library. So, all, Rex actually handles all the phone call, audio parsing, delivery right now for Warbox. Um, the last piece that's missing is finalizing some conversions to Postgres nine one on the Metasploit framework side, and then adding the integer um, uh, array intersection code into our default install. Once we have those two pieces in place, we're ninety-nine percent done with converting Warbox into Metasploit. It's just we've got a few more dependency upgrades we have to do to get there. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, and, and that's Warvox 2.0 as opposed to 1.01, correct? Well, one nine 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 nine. Right, 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 right. Well, it was a, it was you know was a, titled on the the Warvox website as 2.0 from SVN, correct? Something like that. The so website's for, terrible. It's totally my fault. It's <laughs> failed. Like it's, software it's developers like, will use version numbers to their advantage. Hey, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and as they should. Absolutely. So, yeah, Warbox is the Geo Cities of projects I have right now. So, wow, like, wow, wow. wow. There's He's no blink tag Geo though, so it's better than Geo Cities. Awesome. Um, so, a lot of blink tag, man. Don't somewhere a high school. Somewhere a high schooler listening to the show is confused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the the last question I've got around uh, Warbox HD is, you know, has there been any thought around? Um, Involving any other protocol other than uh, IAX for the inter asterisk exchange, something like SIP? Uh, SIP's great. There's actually a gentleman who. So the entire protocol stock in, in Warbox is 
um, encapsulated by a command line utility called iaxrecord.rb. Yep. There's been a gentleman who actually rewrote that script as a Perl script and just, just basically replaced the script name, and it works fine without it. So if you can write a SIP script, any other tool that can produce 8K audio output files based on an incoming number on a server, it doesn't really care what the protocol is. Um, IAX is something you picked up first just because when you look into li the licensing mess around the SIP protocols and RTP and all the various other crap around that, um, it was just a nightmare as far as having something that wasn't like you know GPL, which I'm an anti-GPL version in a lot of ways, but overall it was just a huge pain in the ass to, to talk SIP and RTP in a way that uh, was light and kind of friendly. I mean, put it this way, uh, if I had to convert all the code I converted to IAX in Ruby in like eight hours one night, to, to SIP it would probably take two or three weeks. Oh, hmm. Okay. So, so to that, any preferred providers uh, that uh, are really good for well, IAX? Uh, Vitality does it, but you have to like, tell them you want IAX, and they'll yeah. tell you they don't have it, and you have to convince them, like, yes, you do, I know you do. Um, gotcha. But yeah, actually, yeah. it doesn't mm -hmm. matter, because you can actually take an Asterisk server or a free switch server and make that an IAX to SIP translator very easily. All you do is set up an incoming line for IAX, tell them to route it out through SIP, and you can use any SIP provider with IAX as the protocol still. So that's one of the reasons why I wouldn't feel it to be a huge onus is that even if you don't have an IAX uh, VoIP provider, you can all set up a translator through FreeSwitch or uh, Asterix to do it yourself. Gotcha. Yeah, so FreeSwitch was one that I hadn't heard of. Uh, my Asterix server is uh, feeling some pain. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. It, long story. So I'm going to check out FreeSwitch and see if I can make that work a little bit better. Uh, HC, what, what's Axeman? Uh, Axeman was a failed attempt to make calm fuzzing fun. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, no, did it make com fuzzing work, or is it just a failed attempt at making it fun? Well, it blew the entire category out of the water. Because what happened is we, you know, if you look back at, like, so for folks who aren't familiar with it, um, activist controls are crap. You shouldn't have them. If you have an activist control somewhere in your business environment, you should find the vendor and, you know, show them what happens to horses when you make jello. Um, that's really it. Uh, but it comes down to, like, it, nice. as a client side technology, it's even worse than Java, and Java's freaking bad. Um, so activist controls have, the, have become the terrible mm -hmm. problem of being... Uh, anyways, a lot of problems with Activex. So the thing about uh, Axeman was it actually did all the fuzzing inside the context of the browser. Any result you found using Axeman because it was all driven by JavaScript was a real result because obviously it triggered inside the browser and crashed it. So it was a very, like, you know, if I got a bug, it's a real bug. What happened after that is there's so many bugs knocked out by this program, like 250 different vulnerabilities in the course of, like, 30 days of running it, um, that... Microsoft went back and started doing whitelisting as for all their browsers for Activex controls. So these days you can't test anything unless there's a whitelist for it, and if you have a whitelist for it, there's no reason to go down the X-Men path, there's just better ways to test it. So the whole category kind of got blown out as soon as X-Men was released. Hmm. Very cool. HD, was there anything else you wanted to talk about here on the show? I'm trying to remember what's released and what's still pending right now, but uh, we've been doing a ton of work right now across... Uh, like password testing, uh, one of the biggest changes in Metasploit recently was doing post credentials for database credentials, like uh, post XML models for databases. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you can, if you find a password to like a MySQL database or a Postgres database, dumping the actual user hashes out of those databases as well. And that's something we've been trying to figure out how to wrap our heads around and go forward is, you know, if we have a password to a database, you should have a session. Just like an SMB, you should have a session, even if it's not actually a metropolis session, you should have an SMB session. So looking at those non-interpreter kind of protocol-based uh, sessions, things like database connections or um, SMB connections where you can upload, download files, things like that, um, is really kind of the next big thing for Metasploit for how to wrap our heads around getting there. Mm. Mm. Very cool. Oh, one last question Go I ahead. had. Um, tell us about the move and, the, and the, the reasoning behind the move to get over SVN, and will SVN update continue to work for a while? So SVN update will work indefinitely because we have a, a badass named Trevor Rosen on the team who wrote this code called Charon, which is you know the the ferryman to hell, which takes Git code and brings it down to SVN again. Uh, uh -huh. So what happens every time you commit to Git, it goes to this whole like multi-stage lock process where it gets reviewed, the scrapers, the stuff that happens at the back end, it gets recommitted to an SVN repository. SVN repository gets mirrored to three servers. That server gets mirrored to another server, and then it comes back out again just where it came up before. Nice. Nice. But the reason for moving to Git is we have uh, we expanded our UI team, and our UI team really loves Git, and they finally convinced us that on the error of our ways of using SVN, and branches are just amazing now. Like, we went from basically branching being something you always dreaded and had nightmares about, to you branch for every feature, you branch for every commit, you branch for every merge, you branch for every pull request. So we do, even internally, we do pull requests between team members right now, just because we find it much easier to track what went and where. Oh. Does Git make branch development easier? Is that one of the features? It's almost a, a, an insult to call it branching at that point because yeah. anyone who's done a lot of development with SVN or CVS or RCS or any, you know, Perforce yeah. thinks branching is this thing that 
usually involves something painful going into an orifice. Well, it but usually <laughs> <laughs> well that, and it usually involves that nasty word merge at some point, which no one wants to do. Nothing's a merge. It's all a cherry pick. It's all. <laughs> yeah. There's no such thing as a successful merge. It's true. It's true. So um, Git does a really good job of not only tracking, like, it doesn't do, just do line, line based uh, merges, which is nice, and mm-hmm. the conflict resolution is great, but it was kind of the, all the good parts of a distributed control system with um, the things I actually liked about SVN. Uh, and if you use something like the Git flow workflow, where you actually have, like, a release branch, a stable branch, a checkout branch, it just adds a lot more sanity to the development environment that you can't have otherwise. Um, and it's something that, you know, I'm still not 100% comfortable with it, but it's definitely saved or bacon more than a few times on bad merges and, you know, code getting committed when it shouldn't have. Right, right. Before, we literally had to, like, lock out developers during the period that we did a release so they wouldn't commit something that would break it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> I remember those. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, right, Carlos. <laughs> so has has Metasploit gone through the full... No, no, Carlos has joined the, the Lester's team of people who have broken the trunk more than once a week for a few weeks. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> so me and Carlos are probably the only two people who have consistently broken the trunk and pissed user off, users off for that long. But you guys should get a t-shirt. <laughs> territory. You should get a t-shirt and yeah. be forced to wear it to death. Age of Passive Record. Of course. <laughs> um, so you've seen the full progression of CVS to SVN to Git? I, well, I'm a holdout, right? I used CVS until 2004. I used SVN until, like, mm. 2011. Right. So, <laughs> I'm a freaking dinosaur, but yeah. Now now when Dave Kennedy's on next, we just need to convince him to use Git instead of SVN. Right? There you go. There you go. <laughs> very cool. Well, HD, thank you much for, very, very much for... Wow, I drank a lot of beer during that interview, apparently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for appearing on Paul.com. You're more than welcome to stick around. Uh, we're going to chat with Dave Kennedy and we're going to talk about security news. I understand if you're busy, that's totally fine too. But again, thank you very much for appearing on Paul.com. Hey, thanks guys. It's been a blast. Um, I'll definitely hang out for at least an hour or so. Okay. Sounds awesome. great. Uh, so we will take a short break, come back and, uh, get our next guest who is, uh, none other than Mr. Dave Kennedy on the line. And right now we'll, uh, we'll cut the magic of the, uh, the videos and, uh, probably chill out for about five minutes before we, uh, start our next segment.